declined in my opening. Indeed, sir. Uh, I don't think I need repeat it, uh, but, but just in a sentence that Richard III had first of all asked Brackenbury to do the deed. Brackenbury refused and therefore Sir John Tyrrell was sent and he Quite arranged so. the two servants to smother and bury under the staircase and so on. Um, it's been criticised more, uh, Moore's version, I think as an intellectual joke, a parody, leg pull and obviously invented and so on. Uh, do you place any reliance upon the Moore version of these events? Yes, the criticisms of Moore on the whole are very small minds attacking a very big one, which is not an unusual experience. Uh, if we actually look at Moore's account, it corresponds precisely and in absolute detail with everything that is known of the inner machinery of the royal household. We have then Brackenbury having refused the deed, Richard fuming as he sits, as Moore puts it, at the draft, namely on the privy. Now, this seems very extraordinary because he's actually talking to somebody at the same time. But in those days, as Montaigne said, the higher you were, the less privacy you had, even when you were sitting on the privy. The page is doing what any secret page, either the court of Edward IV or Henry VIII, would have been expected to do. He is advising Richard. He says, outside there, beyond the lavatory door, there is lying on a pallet mattress the man, Sir James Tiddle, who will do the deed for you. That is exactly what would have been happening. Tyrrell, as knight of the body, would have been on the pallet outside the chamber door. The exact procedure is there. This is to be taken seriously. And so Moore discloses how, while uh, the king was on the draft, the privy, that he spoke to his page, and the page suggested Sir John Tyrrell and so on, and he was brought in from outside in order to do the deed. This is, this is an exact parallel, as I said, to known court procedure in periods like my own when we have better documentation and also earlier ones like Edward IV when the office of the groomship of the stool is beginning to emerge, that is the king's lavatory attendant who is becoming the head of the inner royal household. In, in, you, you said this was the beginning of history as distinct from a chronicler, but uh, in what manner did people write in those days? Because again, Moore's embellishments and conversations and interpolated speeches and so on have been criticised as obviously having been invented. I think we have to remember two things about how they wrote. <coughs> Nowadays, when historians want to say that so-and-so existed in such a social context, they write, an un and I speak from experience, they write an unbelievably boring introduction about the social context of England when the man lived. Then you did it much more interestingly. You put it in his own mouth. You would in input speeches there, and everybody knew there was this convention, there's no problem with it. Moreover, we as historians, not perhaps having the same hesitation about dealing with the past of certain lawyers, are able to distinguish truth from falsehood in these matters with very, very few problems. Uh, secondly, I think we should point out that um, there is a different approach to, in terms of documentation. The beginning of history, these men were not writing with great piles of records, indexed nicely in front of them as we have now. They didn't have perpetual calendars as we do now. They got confused about dates because in those days, very often you didn't actually date a document by the day of the month and the year. You used a saint's day, and there were in any case three different years all going together. Uh, Dr. Stark, what you're saying there for Difficulties. It's immensely. difficult to get the facts right and yes. the dates right and so on. Absolutely. For somebody like and mistakes Moore. are deeply popular. Somebody like Moore writing under immense pressure telling us in, in Utopia that he had to snatch time to write from between meals and even from sleep and even from the marriage bed. We you, find mean, you mean pressure of time? Pressure of time, sir. I and see. also great difficulty of sources. For us, it's easy to be accurate. For them, it was very difficult. If I may say so, my lord, even lawyers at that time often got the dates of their statutes wrong because reference to the roles of parliament was very difficult. Can even happen today. And I'm sure <laughs> <in> my life. <laughs> Um, uh, I think uh, the opening lines, in the opening lines, uh, uh, to this part uh, of the story, uh, he uses the words, does more hard that it be not true. And in the closing lines, and thus I have learned of them that much knew and had little cause to lie. Would more have written in that way if he didn't believe in the truth of his version? No, sir. It's suggested, I think, uh, or has been suggested, it may well be suggested today, I know not, that this was biased Tudor propaganda. Uh, does that uh, accord with your view? I think the three very simple things to be said. Propaganda is always better if it's around a basis of truth. 
Everything that Moore says is to be paralleled in detail in works written before the Tudor period. And finally, if, as we so often do, or as the critics of Moore do say, we must not believe him because he makes certain mistakes, that would mean simply, sir, that we had no history because with no man yet who did not make a mistake somewhere. Was there any reason for Moore to have picked on an innocent Sir John Tyrrell and, and, and named him as a murderer in this uh, account? None whatsoever, nor an innocent Forrest, nor an innocent Dighton. Then finally, uh, just a word or two about the other historian, I won't use the word chronicler, the other historian at that time, Polydor Virgil. Again, he was an Italian, I think, but came to England in the early part of the 16th century, 1502, and was commissioned by Henry VII to write a history of England. That is correct. Um, he gives uh, an account very similar to Moore's, but in far less detail. That I think is true. Could, that would be a fair summary, would it? It would. Uh, and um, it's said, of course, that the fact that he doesn't give the same detail as Moore underlines the fact that Moore's detail is wrong. Do you, do you accord with that view? No, I think it's of a piece with the rest of the arguments of people who say that sort of thing. They haven't even bothered to count the number of pages. Polydor Virgil's entire account of the whole reign of Richard is only one quarter of the length of Moore's account of the first few months of it. Polydor Virgil is writing a gigantic history of England, going back to the days of Arthur to his own times. The reign of Richard III is an episode, so for artistic balance, you do not have the same amount of detail. It is as simple as that. And finally, do we find, I think, in, a, in the Fabian Chronicles, that of the uh, a gentleman of the City of London who became Sheriff of London, does he report that it was common fame that Richard had the princes put to secret death? He does indeed. And I think the Chronicles of London, as they are known, uh, uh, the reference being the Vitellius part, do that, does that record he also put to death the two children of King Edward, for which cause he lost the heart of the people? It does indeed, sir. What, yes, thank what you. What are the dates of those, uh, approximately? Um, they, they are essentially reminiscences, sir, if I may, I my lord, if I may interp interpolate. Uh, I do not necessarily put great reliance on them, but they certainly tell us what was happening in the city. They certainly tell us what men of some information, though not great, But thought. they were written in the Tudor period. They were written, indeed, in the Tudor period by men alive at the time, and perhaps coloured by what I am sure will now be called Tudor propaganda. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I thought I might say Tudor and Major. I'm sure you would, sir, yes. Well, uh, does that sound better to you? No, it won't be the first time you've misused a word. It won't be the first time you've misused a word. I dare say. Nor the last. Um, oh, please help. Does it sound better? No. I see. Well, then, if this small lawyer's mind may ask you some questions about the topics on but which you course. have uh, given evidence, Dr. Stacy. Starkey. Uh, you were led... I'm so sorry. Yes. I Mr. do apologise. I do apologise. I must ask one question about the succession, though, to get that out of the way. Uh, I would respectfully uh, accept everything that you have said about succession wiping out illegitimacy if you were to say that it was the anointing and the recognition ceremony within the coronation which would wipe out all past evils. And I think but it would not, be wrong. Uh, I take may it, I finish the question? No, sir, because I think it is founded on, on, it is founded on a completely false premise. I take it, if therefore, you that you do not recognise the succession of Edward VIII, who was not crowned. If you the, role, the role of coronation has never played the part that you're attributing. I think if you allow counsel... I will, I will, sir. I'm sorry, my lord, question. I apologise. Uh, I will pass on, because time presses then. upon me uh, at any rate. Facts, too. Help me, please, about uh, the Duke of Buckingham. I would be right in thinking... And indeed, the jury can see for themselves uh, from the little uh, chart that has been drawn up that the Duke of Buckingham had indeed himself a good claim to the throne. A possible one. Uh, he was directly descended uh, through the Duke of Gloucester, Thomas of Woodstock, was he not? Yes. Could also claim descent from John of Gaunt. But can I leave that on one side entirely for the moment? Uh, in addition, in uh, 1474, Buckingham had obtained the right to use the heraldic device of Woodstock, linking him directly to that descent. Buckingham was um, uh, a very dark and shadowy figure, not a very attractive man, very well-spoken, very plausible, 
uh, with his eyes very much on the throne for himself.